ladies and gentlemen professor bibi lal distinguished the uh, faculty of iit gandhinagar and other friends of iit gandhinagar it is my pleasure to welcome professor bibi lal to iit gandhinagar in fact i met him nearly 23 years back when i was a student at the institute of archaeology new delhi when he delivered some lectures for us so he is one of the foremost uh, archaeologists and it is our pleasure uh, and we are privileged here to have his uh, presence and uh, he will talk really uh, important things about our roots of uh, indian culture so without wasting much time i would uh, like to request professor merotra to give the welcome address uh, namaskar and very good evening to all of you it is indeed a pleasure privilege honor for all of us that uh, the doyen of the pitama of indian archaeology is uh, in our midst this evening uh, on behalf of the institute on behalf of all of you behalf of professor sudeep jain who is not here because of a knee injury and on my on behalf i would like to welcome professor bb lal and his son rajesh air marshal uh, rajesh lal uh, and the archaeology center at iit gandhinagar was created almost 4 years ago 4 and 1/2 years ago to be precise and when the decision of setting up this center was taken almost everyone including our board of governors were uh, taken aback they were surprised how is it that in institute of technology we are setting up a center of archaeology and the reason that we took this very bold decision at that point of time was that this is one area which uh, needs uh, nurturing which requires uh, support from all quarters and iit gandhinagar being a technical institution would have the kind of infrastructure that may also be very helpful for uh, characterizing analyzing uh, the uh, artifacts of uh, uh, archaeological sites so the decision was to make iit gandhinagar as some kind of a hub with decent enough infrastructure which would be made available to almost anyone or everyone working in archaeology serious workers in archaeology who may not have the kind of infrastructure that normally is needed would be made available at iit gandhinagar but uh, yes there were a few things which we were missing uh, the center was not until this uh, evening not blessed in person by the pitama of archaeology uh, today we feel uh, more complete that he is here uh, the whole day he has spent with uh, my colleagues in archaeology uh, try to know about the kind of thing that we have been we have we are trying to do and he has given uh, suggestions ideas which i am sure would be very useful for our future activities uh, so sir it is really an honor uh, to uh, your presence and your gracious presence that uh, is given to us and we'll uh, cherish it for a long long time i don't want to stand between you and the audience because i know how eagerly people are waiting to listen to you so with these words i once again welcome you all to this uh, very fascinating lecture i am sure is going to be fascinating lecture so welcome once again and thank you for coming over here for this lecture sir <laughs> mitchell danino to give a brief uh, uh, formal introduction of dr vibhi lal though we all know that he doesn't need any introduction but i'll still invite Professor Danny Noh for that purpose. Uh, namaskar. Um, thank you, Professor Merotra. A proper introduction of Professor Bibilal will take at least one hour, so I do not propose to do that. 
I propose to simply uh, give you a few landmarks. Uh, he has been active in the field of archaeology, uh, both excavation, research, and also writing about archaeology for more than seven decades. That will help you to gauge the depth of his scholarship. And um, the story began in 1944 at uh, Taxila, ancient Taxila, where he was trained directly by the uh, formidable uh, British archaeologist uh, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, who was uh, called to be the head of the Archaeological Survey of India in 1944. And this was the first training that uh, Professor Bibila underwent. Uh, he continued, uh, he was immediately absorbed uh, in the Archaeological Survey of India and conducted a number of excavations. First of all, as a student of Mortimer Wheeler at Harappa, at Harikamedu, among other places, and then <clears throat> on his own, conducted a number of excavations at sites like uh, Hastinapura, Shishupalgar in uh, Odisha, um, uh, and later on the Harappan, well-known Harappan site of Kalibangan uh, in uh, uh, northern Rajasthan. Uh, in uh, 1968, Professor Bibilal became the Director General himself of Archaeological Survey of India, a post he held till 1972, when he decided to take early retirement uh, from the survey and became a senior professor at Jiwaji University uh, Madhya, uh, in Madhya Pradesh, uh, professor of archaeology, and then he conducted a certain number of projects of his own. Uh, some of which dealt with the archaeology of the two well-known epics of India, Ramayana and Mahabharata, where he posed a question as an archaeologist whether it was to what extent it was possible to substantiate those epics by examining the sites which are uh, traditionally associated with the epics and he excavated, among others, uh, Shringa Verapura in Uttar Pradesh, where he found certain amazing uh, hydraulic structures in particular. Um, to crown this brilliant career in 2000, Government of India awarded the Padma Bhushan to him and uh, then began another career as a uh, author of uh, books of archaeology. I will not attempt to enumerate all the books that he has published uh, some of them were technical in nature, excavation reports, papers. Uh, others were more turned towards the, uh, the, the, broad, the wider public. So books on Ramayana, on Mahabharata, books on the uh, question of the Aryan uh, issue, whether there was or was not a, an invasion or migration by Aryans into India. Then major books on the Harappan civilization. Uh, especially a, 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 a comprehensive study called the earliest civilization of South uh, Asia. And uh, now at the age of 95, he is choking out a new project, which will be at least a three-year project, on a synthesis of all the research and findings on Gangetic archaeology, the archaeology of the Ganges civilization, leading to the emergence of uh, this uh, civilization in the first millennium BC. So this is a new project, very ambitious one, in fact, which is initiating uh, at uh, the present age. So this is a very brief account of his career. It shows you the kind of passion uh, that uh, for the discipline of archaeology and exploring India's ancient past that can sustain him uh, even at this age. Uh, so uh, with these few words, I will request Professor Bibilal to start his lecture. Am I, up? Am I audible? Yes. I am indeed most grateful to the authorities of IIT Gandhinagar for inviting me to this place. Of course, a deliberate talk is just an excuse. But I had the opportunity of seeing your science center. I was keen to see because uh, I thought, uh, I was wondering what time Michel is wasting here or is he doing something really useful. 
and uh, when I went round that one uh, 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 room show and saw those uh, terrifying uh, gadgets, uh, I found that they were really doing very good work, particularly about the study of pottery. You see, uh, sometimes very, uh, I mean, this is quite off uh, my talk, but sometimes very interesting things turn up. And uh, you will be surprised, in the third millennium BC, people from this very area, Gujarat, Lothal, they went to Mesopotamia in boats and uh, they needed uh, water supply all through. So they took with them very big jars uh, uh, full of water. And uh, our friend from Italy, uh, Tosi, he has carried out excavations at, uh, in Oman area and he has found those jars. Now a study of the soil used for those jars shows that the soil was that of Lothal. So you cannot run away from the fact that people going from uh, Lothal carried those pots. So, I mean, scientific study of pots, the soil, the metabolism gives us a lot of important information. In fact, I was talking to uh, was Sharma uh, that uh, I went in 1951 uh, to London at the Institute of Archaeology and uh, I had to deliver a talk at uh, Cambridge and my teacher Sir Mortimer Wheeler was requested to preside over the lecture. After the lecture was over, those were the days when I had just completed my excavation at Hasnapur and found a pottery called the Painted Graveware. It's a graveware with painted designs in black. So, uh, I carried some pieces with, him, with me and in the Cambridge University uh, Museum, there were some trays which contained uh, some material from Thessaly, Greece. And when I opened that tray, I was surprised to find that the ware was identical with the Hasna Now I played a trick on Sir Mortimer Villa. Usually on the pottery, on one side, you make the marking, such and such place, the Dhala Vira or Luthal. So, I had the shirts from Hastinapur. Then, th th those were the shirts from Thessaly in Greece. I put them upside down so that one could not see whether uh, which is the place from which these shirts had come. And I told Sir Mortimer, this is the pottery all from Greece. He said, no, no, it can't be. I opened up the thing and I said, there were the Greece pieces, there were pieces from Hastinapur. Of course, it is usually style. He just <laughs> laughed at the whole thing. But I was talking to uh, my friends there in the science center uh, to study that material. I brought two pieces from there and uh, the Hasnapur pieces. Now, if we can really examine, they are graveware, they are painted. Now, if we can establish that the soil used in the um, Greece examples, in the Greek examples, is the same as at Hasnapur. Would it not be something wonderful? I mean, some people went from here and we know, I mean, the similarity of language, Greek and Sanskrit and all this. So at some point of time, people moved about to those places. We have evidence uh, in uh, Turkey uh, of uh, Indian gods being mentioned in the seas there in the Varun Nasat and all that. So, such kind of studies are really very useful. And I hope, uh, uh, what is the name? You were doing this. Who was doing this petrology? Hi, Vinod. Yes, right. So, we don't forget to keep it in mind 
uh, whenever you come to Delhi, I can give you those shirts from Greece and you can compare them. Try. What is the harm? Now, another very important thing that came through when I was having a, a, an exchange of ideas with our Professor Mahrotra, this is <laughs> there is a, a group of uh, copper objects which are known as copper hoods because usually they are found in large number in hoods so they are called copper hoods these are four or five very characteristic types in that hoods one is antenna sword a long sword with the hilt bifurcating like an antenna. Then you have got harpoons. Then you have got swords. Then anthropomorphic figure. A figure, flat figure in copper with hands like this and head there in a circular fashion. Now one of the pieces found about a decade ago is very peculiar. Now these copper holes, they are datable to a period in the last quarter of the third millennium BC and first quarter of the second millennium BC. That is the time range of about four, five hundred years. Then we have got the Harappan culture, which is in the third millennium BC. And this particular piece has got three features. It is an anthropomorphic figure with, of course, boar's head, which is an early historical uh, feature. You don't have boar earlier than that. Then there is a unicorn on the chest, which is very characteristic of the Arapan culture. And then you may not be able to see, or if you see, there are uh, two lines of inscription on that. Uh, which are in a script called the Brahmi, uh, used by, uh, during the time of Ashoka and a little earlier, 3rd, 4th century BC. Now, we have all along been wondering what is the origin of this Brahmi script. Various views have been expressed by Western scholars and Indian scholars, but we do not yet know what is the origin of the Brahmi. Now, this piece I call it a Triveni Sangam. It has got the Harappan unicorn, it has got the copper hood element of the anthropomorphic figure, and it has got the Brahmi script. The whole question is it is found while somebody was digging uh, a foundation trench for the house. And uh, since these things come under the Antiquities Act, the Archaeological Survey of India got uh, possession of this. It is lying in the uh, museum in Puranakila, Delhi. Now, a question that I posed to our learned friend, uh, Professor Mehrotra, that please give us the benefit of our knowledge of metallurgy and tell us whether that is a genuine piece or a faked one. If it is a faked one, then we forget about it. But if it is a genuine piece, it is really very important because at once it throws the antiquity of Brahmi by about a thousand years. All along we have been groping in the dark. We are trying to build up a, uh, um, a sort of a history for writing, but we have failed so far. So I hope uh, Professor Mahrutra will help us. Whenever you feel like uh, you come to Delhi, I'll arrange for you to have a look at it. Now, why I say this? Because uh, often one can very easily say that this is a fake thing. But to fake it, uh, a thing like this, with these three features, the person who faked it must have a knowledge of a Brahmi writing. He must be familiar with the Harappan unicorn. I mean, so many things, so it must be a super, super expert who faked it, if it is a fake thing. So let us really come to know. Professor Bala Subramaniam, why I Kanpur, I requested him, he started working on it. 
but then unfortunately we have no more so i think professor marutra will oblige us by uh, solving this major problem now uh, i have to waste your time on this thing which is not the part of my talk i move on to the uh, talk put it in mute now uh, we have to take in the topic how deep are the roots of indian culture in our religious inquiries you see my guru sir martin merville when he carried out excavations at harappa in 1946 after the excavations he found the is uh, 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 city and the fortification around the settlement in the vedas indra is said to be purandar destroyer of the fort so he at once jumped at the idea and he says here is the fort and here is purandar in the vedas of so the vedic people must have destroyed the harappan civilization and he wrote quite a lot on this and he says it was completely destroyed leaving no signs whatsoever of the civilization when i studied the material from various sites like mohenjo-daro harappa and my own excavations at kaliyung and a few places even lothal uh, from here near andavad only 60 miles away i found that this quite a lot really which has continued through the time 5000 years of continuity Next to now, for the past four or five decades, India has been witnessing what we call a kind of cultural invasion from the West. One sees, for example. in metropolises like delhi mumbai i don't think uh, ahmedabad will come in category that category because ahmedabad there thinks is old culture uh, compared to delhi and mumbai which are flying fast so we there we see uh, young girls and boys in western dresses attending uh, disco clubs reveling in valentine days completely westernized i do not know how many of you or whether i should refer at this point the practice of living in living in has also been copied by our young people I remember one very interesting thing in 1971 I was invited as a visiting professor at the University of Chicago for one year I had some students in my class I uh, invited them one day for tea at my residence and I introduced uh, them to my wife who was there with me and uh, I uh, told her that this is Mr so and so this is mrs so and so the young man was so furious with she could do you say what do you mean i said you people have been coming to my class together you live in the same house so it, according to the indian tradition it was normal for me to think that you are husband and wife he said no nothing of the kind so that practice of living together without getting married has also been copied by your people and i don't know one, one day we would get back to the stone age when there was no marriage and people were freely living together i mean i won't be surprised if after three or four generations this becomes the normal practice as in many of my own relations do that young people then later on after quite a few years 
They choose to get married, they do. Otherwise, they continue. Anyway, <coughs> this phenomenon is a phenomenon at the moment, particularly of the big cities. But the real culture of this country lives in villages. India accounts for 95% villages. So the real Indian culture is in the villages and not in the cities. Next one. Now I'll show you some examples uh, how various features of our culture have continued from the Harappan times. Now this is a person whom everybody knows. I need not introduce him. This is a yoga guru uh, eh? ah. This is the yoga guru Baba Ramdev who has taken upon himself, now it is about 30 years that he has been teaching uh, 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 teaching uh, yoga exercise. Next one please. Here is a class he uh, held by him on yoga. Now this thing has been devised and you will be surprised or perhaps you know it that yoga has come back to India via United States. Yoga has come back to India by United States. Oh, you see, my son, uh, two sons live in Los Angeles. And there is a street uh, on which there are, uh, I mean, every half a mile you see one yoga class, one yoga class. And they have done the, it in their own way. But uh, they seem to claim that they are now the original yoga masters. Well, anyway, I'm not uh, going into that, who is the master, but this practice, next one, please. You see, in the second millennium and second century BC, there was a great sage called Patanjali. He was, most of you must have heard about him. He wrote a book called Yoga Shastra, in which he talks of the yoga system as a whole. There are eight parts, Ashtanga Yoga, Yam, Niyam, Pranayam, Pratyahar, Dharana, Dhyan and Samadhi. That was the ultimate aim of the yoga practice. Now the Western yoga has nothing to do with Samadhi, has nothing to do with the spirituality. They are only exercises. But nevertheless, the, uh, at least something is being done. So, these eight parts of the system were there as far back in the second century BC. Next one. And if we further go back, here see the ter terracotta figures from uh, Harappa and Mahanjadaro. One, uh, one to four are from Harappa and five and six from Mahanjadaro. Various kinds of asanas are being done. Next one, please. Now, the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 6 talks of the technique of meditation because ultimately the aim is to have Samadhi through meditation. And uh, there it is mentioned some preks nasika drum. Fix your gaze on the uh, tip of the nose. You see, if you do that, the mind gets control. It doesn't run away. There are two, three ways in which it can be done. One is you just observe your breath. Observing the breath is good enough for controlling the mind. In that process, when you fix your gaze on the tip of the nose, uh, again the mind gets controlled. Now, this fixing of some preach nasika agram is, uh, was practiced um, as far back as the Harappan times. Next. Now here is the famous figure of limestone and uh, this particular piece you are familiar with comes from uh, Mohanjadaro 
and you can very well see if you fix your uh, gaze on the tip of the nose, the eyelids come down. They are not fully open, they come down because you are watching, having a look at the nose. This is exactly what is happening here. Look at the eyes, they are half closed. Next one please. Here is the famous figure of Shiva in the form of Pashpati. Pashwati is one of the aspects of Pashwati and what is happening? Is one of the aspects of song. Uh, one of the aspects of Shiva. Now, uh, now this Shaivism, next one please, is continuing even today. In the upper part of this illustration, you see a modern Hindu temple in which there is Ling and Yoni and uh, there is a tripod and on that is placed a pot from the bottom of which there is a little hole, water keeps on dripping. This kind of thing you must have seen if you have been to a, a temple uh, of Yoni and Ling. Now, Below is a figure which comes from Kali Bangan. It is exactly the same Ling and Yoni. The Ling and Yoni worship goes back to the Harappan times. Next one. Then in this figure, this comes from Harappa. This was excavated by Kenoyer and he published it. In the right part of the picture you see a seated figure which resembles a yogi or a Shiva. He is sitting in a special uh, position. Now in front of him is a human figure and a buffalo. The human figure holds uh, a harpoon in the right hand, holds the um, horn of the buffalo places the uh, foot on the head and is trying to kill it. This is supposed to be the offering of the buffalo to Shiva. And this is a practice which continues. Either Shiva or Kali offering of buffaloes is there all the way. In Calcutta and even in Himachal it is done. Next one please. Now, I show you a plan of the place called Kali Bangan. It is in Rajasthan on the bank of the uh, ancient Saraswati. This site has been thoroughly excavated and we have a very good plan of the settlement. On the left you see the citadel which has two parts. In the northern part you have a, a, a residential complex of the priests and in the southern part there are platforms in which ritualistic uh, features are there like uh, uh, I'll show you this right, uh, fire altars and other things <laughs> and uh, in the right part is this uh, general habitation area in which the agriculturists and uh, Business committee were living. Next one, please. Now, here is a view of what we call fire altars because uh, it's something like about a meter in length, half a meter in width, about 25 centimeters in depth, and there are these offerings around uh, idli like cakes, and there is central still, and the sides are all burnt because of fire. So it is something associated with fire. Exactly to which uh, ancient system it is uh, connected, uh, it's very, I mean, exact description I have not yet worked on, but it is a, a kind of fire altar associated with fire worship. Next one, please. Now, in the citadel area, on a high platform, you have got not one. In the, in the house, it was uh, one in a room. 
and the same room continued all through for that purpose. Here on the citadel there is a public sort of thing and there are seven of them you find in a row. They are disturbed by a liquor drink but uh, you find seven of them. The same kind of uh, offerings. In front is a pot, bottom, lower part of the pot in which we found charcoal. Uh, evidently some fire was kept ready for the worship. Next one please. And these are the fire altars, but close to them is a well, a bathing platform, which shows that probably the practice of having a bath prior to worship was also practiced there, which is a normal Hindu tradition. Next one, please. Then you have the swastika. Here is a house of a poor person, but he has swastika at the entrance. And swastika goes back to Harappan times. Next one, please. The Kamandalu. We have seen uh, these mendicants moving about. If you go to Allahabad, you will find many of them roaming about with the Kamandalu. This Kamandalu goes back to the Mahanjadara times. Next one, please. There is a very interesting thing. Now, this is a modern uh, system of plowing the food a field, agricultural field. There is a crisscross pattern, uh, a set of uh, furrows going north-south, widely spaced, and a set of furrows going east-west. Next one, please. And what the people do now, in the widely distanced furrows, they grow mustard. And in the other one, gram. And there is a very scientific reason for it. I mean, if you closely study. Now, we are in the northern hemisphere. In, these are winter rocks. In, in winter, the sun goes down further south. So the shadows are longer and longer and longer. The widely distance furrow in which mustard plant is grown, they run north-south. Now, had they run east-west, they would overshadow the um, gram plants and gram plant would not have come up, they would have suffered. So knowingly, widely distant furrow uh, in that the planted mustard plant and the other one you have got a uh, uh, Next one please. Now this is exactly what we found in Harap, uh, uh, in Kalibangan. Here is a, a view of the excavated field. You know, we have to do it only with brush. We couldn't use uh, even a big knife. So little by little, and we have got the same pattern. The widely distant furrow and the narrowly distant. Now, evidently, uh, this must have been the same practice. And we have got uh, grains of mustard, we have got grounds. So the same sort of cultivation is going on. Next one, please. Now here is uh, uh, Air Marshal Asthana and his wife. And if you have a closer look at the female figure, you will find she has got a central uh, mang. And in that uh, there is a sindur in it, a red one. That figure you can see the red. Now this epic, uh, married women in most part of India, they apply Sindhu to their food. Now, surprisingly, this very thing goes back to the period of Naushar. Uh, it's about 2680 uh, BC, about say 3000 BC, 5000 year old thing. These are the terracotta figures, and they are and there are three colors in them. The Ornaments are in yellow, showing that they are made of gold. The hair is black, which is the natural color. And in between, in the central line, you find the sindhu. So this practice of applying sindhu to the forehead goes back to the Harappan times. Next one, please. Now here is another thing. Wearing um, spiral 
Bengals. This is the uh, top left is the famous uh, Brahmas figure, which we call the dancing girl. She wears that spiral bangles. Uh, uh, and lower, uh, we have found an actual specimen from Konal in early Harappan lands. You can see that uh, actual specimen. And on the right side, you find a modern lady uh, wearing those uh, bangles uh, in the head, both the hands. So, this practice of wearing. Uh, in Gujarat, you see quite a lot of it. Delhi may not show you that, but here we see. Next one, please. Then there is another uh, uh, another gadget or whatever you call it. You see, this is a conical thing. With women in Haryana put it, and a newly wearing uh, woman has to be presented with this sort of thing uh, at her marriage. This is a practice almost compulsory. Now, this piece, uh, in the upper part, you see the females wearing that. Uh, I mean, you can't see that she has got the ghungat, but then uh, you can see the conical top of it. Down below is a piece from Mohanjadaro in gold. Exactly the same thing. Next one, please. Then even such things like, I don't know whether you have come across or not. In this picture on the right, I bought from uh, uh, Aligarh uh, a gadget which has got three parts in it. One is used for taking frost out between the teeth. The cup sort of thing is used for taking wax out of the air. And the teaser for take, picking up the hair, I remember having done that with my mother, who used to have that. Uh, in the lower part of the lid, sometimes a small uh, hair grew up, and we have to remove. Exactly the same thing on the left side, you see the three in one gadget in that picture. Next one, please. Some of the games go back to the time. And uh, on the left, we see the gamesmen, different varieties. These were excavated by S.R. Rao at Lothal. And you can see the variety of them. On the right, he has put them uh, on the chessboard. And the game of chess goes back to Harappan times. Next one, please. And even the other kind of uh, gamesmen, you, you have got a cubicle thing, which had got six blind holes. One, two, three, four, and five, and six, on the six faces. On the top is the modern example. Down below, you have got an example from uh, the Harappan civilization. The same pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six. Next one. Even, uh, I don't know, but uh, some of you may have used this kind of patti, uh, wooden slate on which uh, we used to write with a uh, white ink and all that sort of thing. Now, th this is a rectangular piece with a projection on one side, and in that projection there is a hole also. So, after we had written the thing, washed it off, you put it on the nail, on the nail and hang it. Exactly the same kind of thing. You see, uh, the one on the top are examples from the Arapan civilization. In the middle, I will not be able to to you, there is a um, child who is uh, pointing to a slate on which Brahmi script is written. This uh, is a second century BC example coming from Haryana. And down below is the uh, a madarsa where uh, people are still using this. Of course, uh, in the next generation, computer alone will be there in primary school, so we will have all forgotten about this. Next one, please. Even, you know, it is very, uh, it is 
it has been a very common practice uh, with the grandmothers who take the grandchildren uh, with them in the bed uh, and uh, tell them stories. Um, now here is the story of the wise crow. In this uh, delineation, this is part from Lothal, and um, here you see uh, there is a crow, there is a pot, then a tree, and then a deer. Now the deer is looking backwards at the crow. He, uh, the deer wanted to drink water from the pond, but because of the horns, he could not insert his mouth in it. So poor chap, he had to go away without drinking. But then he, the crow came and uh, there is a delineation in the pot of some small pebbles. See why he was wise enough. He picked up some pebbles, put them in the pot and the water level rose and he drank to his content. So the wise crow this story. Ne next one. This is a story again uh, of a cunning fox. Down below is seen the fox. Sitting on the tree uh, are two birds. They are holding a fish in their beak. Now the, uh, it occurred to the fox that that is how the story goes. That they should praise these birds and tell them that they are very good singers. Why not give us a song? The moment the uh, birds got elated, they opened their mouth, they picked up that thing and the bird and uh, the fox ran away with it. So this is that story that is shown. Next one, please. And of course, uh, in the upper part, you see Bajpayeji, Adwaniji, uh, when uh, the uh, president was uh, about to leave on a foreign tour, they are goodbye uh, with folded hands. And down below you see a terracotta figure uh, in that very attitude of Namaste. So the practice of uh, greeting people with Namaste is as old as the Harappan dance. Next one, please. Now the question arises, who are these Harappans? Who were they ethnically? Uh, and uh, this is, now I'm coming to the theory part of it. Who were the Harappans? Uh, in the 19th century, Max Muller dated the Vedas to 1200 BC. Now his methodology was like this. The Upanishads and Sutra literature, he said, all right, we accept that they belong to the 6th, 7th century BC. Before that, there are stages of the Aranyakas, Brahmanas, and the Vedas. He gave very generously 200 years to each one of these phases. So 600 plus 200 plus 200 plus 200, he arrived at the figure of 1200 BC for the Vedas. Now, we must really not cry foul for the simple reason that that was a time, 19th century, the Vedas were not known. Credit must go to him to bring them to the notice of the Western world. And if in that process he dated them to only 1200 BC, we should forgive him. Because he applied some method. But then uh, when his colleagues like Goldstecker, Wilson and others, when they objected to this kind of ad advocacy, saying why 200 years and why not 100 years, or why not 500 years for each group, so he, was no, he had no answer. Then finally he gave up. He said uh, the Vedas may be 1000 BC, maybe 2000, maybe 3000 BC, no power on earth will ever detect me. Fortunately, next one please, we have been able to sort this out and uh, you will find it very 
interesting way in which the Vedas have been dated now. Of course, in 1920, when the Harappan civilization was discovered, it was dated to the 3rd millennium BC because many of the Harappan objects were found in West Asia where they were already dated. So, transferring the date to the Indian situation, it was accepted by all that the Harappan civilization belonged to the 3rd millennium BC. What is the result of it? Because Max Muir had said that the Vedas are no older than 1200 BC, the Vedic people were outright rejected, that they could not have been the authors of this civilization. Because 1200 BC and 3rd millennium BC, that was the situation. Then Wheeler, uh, in his excavation, uh, as I told you earlier, found a fortification wall and he used the theory of Purandar, that is the star of the whole. So they said, the Aryans must have come and completely destroyed the Harappan civilization. Next one. In support of his theory, he cited some uh, skeletons from Mohanjadaro. The, but uh, he forgot to go deeper into the matter. These skeletons were found at different levels of the site, not one level. Now, if it was a, um, 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 uh, an attack by a foreign agency, they must belong to one place, one level, but they come from different levels. So, this uh, different stratigraphic levels clearly shows that that was not a massacre, otherwise he called them. So, Dills very nicely said the mythical massacre at Manjadara. Now, if I said at that time, probably I would be accused of being uh, too much of an Indian. But, but if an American says, they accept it. Next one, please. Then there is evidence of uh, anthropology. Hemphill and his colleagues have examined a number of his skeletal remains from different and he has come to the conclusion that between 4500 BC and 800 BC no new people came from outside. So the, clearly there is no evidence of any foreigners invading India. Now the uh, Aryans were not invaders nor were they immigrants, then were they indigenous? Next one, please. Now, answer to this lies in fixing the date of the Rig Veda. And here is something uh, I would like to have your attention very closely how this has worked out. You may have heard the name of Saraswati River. Saraswati is mentioned in the Rig Veda 70 times. It was a river par excellence. It is said to be Ambitame, the best of the mothers, Nagitame, the best of the rivers, Devitame, the best of the goddesses. And uh, it is said, Gribhyo Asamvatra, from the mountains to the sea it used to go. It was a very tremendous river. Now, excavationist Kalivangan has shown that this river dried up about 2000 BC on the basis of carbon-14 dates on the site and on cases of the boring in the riverbed. Now, if Saraswati dried out about 2000 BC and in the time of the Rigved, it was a flowing river, that means Rigved must be pre-2000 BC, that is in the third millennium BC. Now, this is a very important conclusion which we get from the the river source. Uh, here is the view of the Saraswati River. A number of Harappan sites are on its bank in the Saraswati system. Next one, please. Now, uh, 
as I have already said, the river dried up in 2000 BC. So the Rigved must be pre-2000 BC, that is the third millennium BC. How much earlier is anybody's guess? Next one, please. Now, then there is another very, very, very important thing in the Rigved. In the 10th month, Sukh 75, there are two verses. And they enumerate the rivers of the entire region from Ganga Yamuna on the east, Saraswati, Satudri and all that, Jhelam Bias and all that, up to the Indus and its western tributaries, Kubha, Kurram and all that. It is written in such a wonderful way as if it has been a geography textbook. All the rivers in the serial order they are mentioned. Now, <coughs> The point of importance to us is that the Vedic people, who we have just said that they were in the third millennium BC, were occupying the region from Ganga Yamna on the east all through up to the uh, Indus River. The question is simply what was the material culture? Who were the people who were occupying this culture? What was it? And it is nothing but the Arab culture. Next one, please. So this map shows that the Arab civilization and the Vedic civilization are just two face faces of the same coin. The Arab civilization is the same as the Vedic civilization. We have long, for very long, avoided this. The Westerners were most of them saying that they are not. But here is an evidence, and my latest book was published, uh, uh, The Rigvedic People, whether they are uh, indigenous or invaders or immigrants, and in which I have discussed all this. And till today, there is no comment on this. Nobody has come forward saying that I was wrong. I welcome it. You see that there is something wrong in my line of argument, but nobody has come. Now, if the Harappans and the Vedic people are the same, the question is, are they indigenous? Now, at a site called Bhirana, we said we had the earlier stages of the Harappan civilization. And those states, on the carbon-14 date basis, go back to 5th and 6th millennium BC. So at least we can trace back the antiquity of the Harappan civilization to 5th or 6th millennium BC. And since Harappan civilization and Vedas are two faces of the same coin, the Vedic people have been here right from the 6th millennium BC. We are trying to find out what is the earlier stage. It may come up one day, but uh, the Vedic people were indigenous and not invaders. Next one, please. Now, as I showed you, so many features of our culture go back to the Harappan times. All through these are continuing. Now, pondering over this, one of the poets, you may have heard the name of Allama Yakbal. Yakbal, he says, next one, please. He writes, Yunan Mishra Roma summit gaye jahan se. Yunan Mishra Roma summit gaye jahan se. Ab tak magar hai baapi namo nishahamar. कुछ बात है कि हस्ती मिट्टी नहीं हमारी कुछ बात है कि हस्ती मिट्टी नहीं हमारी सदियों रहा है दुश्मन दौरे जहां हमारा the entire world has been inimical to us we have so many invasions one after the other but the basic element of our culture continues whereas in Egypt there is nothing now of the old Egyptian culture Mesopotamia no but India is a country which has carried on its tradition. Next one. 
ना वॉट इज दैट कुछ बात हस्ती मिट्टी नहीं हमारी कुछ बात है कि ऐसी हस्ती मिट्टी नहीं हमारी वी हैव द आंसर इन दर्ड्स ऑफ द ग्रेटेस्ट मैन ऑफ अर टाइम महात्मा गांधी वट इड इज ही एडवाइज अस दैट वाई वी शुड कीप अवर डोर्स एंड विंडोज वाइड ओपन सो दैट फ्रेश एयर वी कम फ्रॉम डिफरेंट डायरेक्शन दैट मीन्स वी शुड नॉट शट अवर डोर्स टू एनी कल्चर बट वी मस्ट रिमेन सीटेड इन अवर ओन कल्चर वी मस्ट रिमेन फर्मली सीटेड इन अवर ओन द सोल द सोल ऑफ इंडिया लिवज अमन थैंक यू वेरी मच Professor Devi Pai, to come forward in as a token of appreciation. Uh, it's now open for questions. He, he opens the lecture for any questions to be had. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. I may not be able to answer them, but I make an attempt. so many thanks uh, about the chronological sequences of uh, our vedas and then looking for the archaeological evidences in this sequences uh, uh, where I'm, the uh, sorry i am worried i am not able to follow you okay so my question is then about the events related to mahabharata and ramayana where can we put those events in 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 the form of this chronological sequences and then what are the evidences for that I only heard two words from Mahabharata and Rama. Yes. Yeah. The rest of the question I have not heard. It is about the chronology of those times. Uh, what is? This is just so much of echo. What is the archaeological uh, evidence for Mahabharata and Ramayana? And how the chronology? How does the chronology work? Oh, this is quite outside this evening's talk. Now, if I open the Pandora's box, you can imagine what will happen. I'll have to uh, show. I'll have to show you the evidence. I mean, just as you, I also was very skeptical about the historicity of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. But then I thought, you see, I got one very interesting clue, and that interesting clue was that uh, the names of the sites associated. I'll take a Mahabharata first. Uh, the names of the sites associated with the Mahabharata story are today exactly the same as they were in the time of the Mahabharata. Hastinapur is the same. There is no other Hastinapur except Mathura is the same. There is no other Mathura except Panipat is the those five villages in the Prasambhur region. Five villages in the Prasambhur region. Prasambhur they are the same. Kurukshet is the same. Kampil is the same from where Drupadi came, so there is no place which has disappeared. Even Purana Kila, which is in the first uh, Homayun and Shesha, put a fort around it. But we have excavated, and within the fort, we have found material of the same type as at Hastinapur. All these places are uh, uh, show the same kind of material culture. Which is distinguished by a pottery called painted graver. There, I have not come across any site uh, associated uh, either through literature or through local legend uh, uh, with the Mahabharat, which has not yielded this painted graver. Not even one site. So much so that as you go from Meerut to Hastinapur. On the way, there is a site called Sani, and there is a funny tradition about it. Bhim passed by this site. He dusted his shoes, and the mound grew up. Now, how much dust he had on his shoes? But the, uh, there is an association of the site with Bhim. Like uh, there is a site called Kutana, which is associated with Kunti. So even local tradition, not uh, a written tradition, but oral tradition. Wherever the sites are associated with the latest story, uh, 
to be find this thing. And then in archaeology, archaeologically, we got some very, very interesting evidence. Hastinapur, uh, I'll take something like 10 minutes to explain to you, then alone it will be possible. In, in the uh, 1950 and uh, 52, I carried out excavations at Hastinapur and you know Dushai was telling me this morning that I should tell you some personal experiences. So here I can uh, tell you some personal experiences. We were excavating at Hastinapur. See, imagine this is the mount from here to descend. On one side we were excavating and we were finding this painted grave. On the river side, this side is the river, Ganga. On the river side, we did not find a painted grave. And we were completely baffled. What is the reason? If it is the same mound, it must still be the painted grave. But, uh, see, one sixth of the mound on the river side did not yield it, whereas the five sixth part of the mound, they yielded the painted grave. I was thinking about this thing all the time, didn't have good sleep. One night at about one o'clock, uh, an idea occurred to me. Is it that this part of the mound was washed away by the Ganga? That's why we are not getting anything here. At one o'clock, myself, uh, my chief excavation assistant, Mukherjee, and B.K. Thapar, who became director general, we, he was there with me as pottery assistant. We, at one o'clock, we took the Petromax lamp, went to the site, take, took some uh, pickaxes and shovels, some labor, chokidars in the night, and we started work on it. By the morning, we found that, yes, there was a clear-cut line in the section, on one side of which you had the painted grave, on the other side you didn't. So we extended that trench, and in the trench we found evidence of a flood having occurred and having cut away the mound. We can very clearly, if you want I can show you, I have slides also for that. Uh, the erosion line, the material that was uh, washed away and that got deposited. And not only that, we, we said that if the river has done this havoc, it is just likely that in the river bed there may be something still available. So we did four boats in the river bed, right in front of the mound. And in two of them we found the same painted grave, uh, though in a uh, I mean, uh, not so crisp a shape because they, they were lying in the water, all water logging and all that, but we found it. So, the, uh, it was very clear that the Hasnapur Mount was washed away by this. And here comes uh, literary evidence in the picture. You see how uh, literature and archaeology put together they explain many things. Uh, in the Puranas, there is a reference Gangaya Aparte Tasman, Gangaya Aparte Tasman, Nagare Nagasave, Tektwa Nichakshu Nagaram, Kausham Vyamsa Nivatsiti. During the time when uh, Nichakshu was the ruler of Hastanapur. There occurred a heavy flood in the Ganga. Gangaya Aparte Tasman Nagare Nagasavi. Tepta Nichakshu Nagaram Kausham Vyam Sanivas. Nichakshu will abandon Hastanapur and start his uh, capital at Kausham. Now, this little, I mean, the flood. We first got the evidence in excavation about the uh, erosion and cutting away of the mound. 
literature confirmed it. And this part of literature that the capital was shifted to Kashambi in the time of Nishan is supported by archaeology. A kind of degenerate painted graver, ghost sort of thing. In the earlier levels, it was very fine. Chris, uh, very nice painted designs, but later on, time passed, it became thicker. Painted designs were only simple lines. That material is in Kaushambi. So when I went to Allahabad, I examined that and photographed that and published that. So uh, literature and archaeology, they combined evidence very clearly shows that there was historicity of the Mahabharata. Hello. Uh, so actually I have two questions. Okay. First one, at, uh, so uh, I, uh, during the time of Hitler, Hitler was very obsessed with art uh, during the Nazi period. So. Uh, how that Aryan race is related to, uh, or how much similar it is to the Vedic Aryan race we are talking about. What is the question? Um, during the Second World War, Hitler... Are we required to comment on Hitler's uh, fantastic views? I mean, he had his own purpose. He wanted to gear up some people, uh, pro-Aryans, he said he is Aryan. So it was sort of exploiting a situation. There is nothing uh, important about it. The fact of the matter is that most of the European population is Aryan or was Aryan, mixed with the local people. You see, the Greeks here, you know, the Greek language, the Latin language, the Sanskrit, they come from the same stock. Uh, my question is, since our childhood, uh, we used to hear that Allahabad is situated at the confluence of Yam Ganga, Yamuna and Saraswati. Allahabad is situated at the confluence of Ganga, Yamuna and Saraswati. Now, we know that uh, Saraswati used to flow in in the western India. So, how this, uh, how did this story propagate? Uh, this is about uh, uh, or which is effect? Uh, or your voice is not very clear. Uh, um, Michel will be the interpreter. <laughs> Tell me what is it. The, the question is about uh, uh -huh. the Triveni Sangam at Allahabad. Uh -huh. And how does it, uh, since uh, the Saraswati which you have shown is flowing to the west, what is the relationship between the two? Very interesting question. My next book is coming up, which is titled Tradition vis a vis Archaeology. How far tradition is to be accepted? Is there really some evidence for the tradition uh, to be accepted? I have taken about a dozen examples of various sorts and showed that archaeology does uh, substantiate the tradition. And uh, this is one of the topics. Uh, in fact, the other day in Delhi we had a meeting about the Saraswati project and it was being chaired by the minister. Uh, and uh, when I gave a presentation, after that uh, the secretary asked me the same question which you are asking. What is the evidence about there being Tirvani Sangam? Tirvani Sangam refers to the confluence of three rivers, Ganga, Yamuna and Saraswati. If you ever go to have a bath at Sangam, the Panda will always tell you that here is Ganga, which you can see, a dirty river. Here is Yamuna, which is blue, full of water. Ganga has only four feet of water in that, whereas in Yamuna it is 40 feet. It's a very deep river. Anyway, these two you can see. Then the Panda tells you that they, from somewhere below comes the Saraswati. Naturally, you can't believe him. Uh, you will take it that he is just uh, saying it for the sake of saying and there is no basis. But there is a basis for it. And uh, now I will tell you what is the basis. Who was it with whom we were discussing? Uh, 
uh, in the science center about this uh, working on the Saraswati. Three major events took place in India's history around 2000 BC. One was the end of the uh, drying up of the Saraswati. The other was the rise of the Bata Markanda divide, which blocked the way of Saraswati and the water didn't come. As a result of that, the Saraswati where water must find its own place. So water, uh, instead of going westward, turned eastwards and through Yamuna tier joined the Yamuna. As a result of which, there was a, a very heavy flooding of the area. Way back, I think in early 50s, 1950s, I published a paper in American Anthropologist, a deluge which deluge and all that. And uh, the whole area, particularly the upper part of the Ganga Yamuna Dwab, was flooded. At a place called uh, Bahadrabad, these copper hood tools are there below uh, six meters of deposit of sanded uh, pebbles. That must have been carted by some river. So this uh, heavy flooding of the area. So Saraswati, which got diverted from its original source, joined the Yamuna. So the Sangam already took place uh, further up in the Himalayas. Uh, and then that memory continued. And uh, it is not today's Panda who is bluffing you. It is mentioned in the Puranas. The Saraswati Sangam and the Puranas, how, howsoever late you may them, they will be 2nd, 3rd century BC to 3rd, 4th century AD. So even as early as that, the Sangam was recognized. India is the world's most, uh, be, world's biggest religious. Uh, I want to know that uh, in how many countries the Indian culture is, was spread uh, in ancient time. This is about the great deal of Southeast Asia uh, was influenced by Indian culture. Uh, Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, so many areas. Even today, if you go to Indonesia, in the evenings they have a program in which the Ramayana and Mahabharata both are uh, shown by the people. They don't know the language. They don't know anything. They don't even know who these people are. But the local people is still go on with uh, showing uh, that play of the Mahabharata and Ramayana. In fact, we are going to have uh, an impress festival in November and we are inviting these Indonesian people to come and demonstrate, uh, uh, give us a show on the Mahabharata. So the culture is living. There are temples even now. Is it broken up by appreciation? Any? As a token of our very deep appreciation for the visit today to the Institute of Professor B. B. Lau, the doyen of the archaeologists in India, and his insightful lecture delivered today, I feel very delighted as a token to give you a memento on behalf of the group from the archaeological center of this institute. Thank you very much. I have to depend all the time on Rajesh. He would put this bookshop. <laughs>